Hi, this is Frodi, and today we will explore three key ideas from Talent is Overrated by Jeff Colvin. Talent is Overrated, subtitle, what really separates world-class performers from everybody else. Jeff Colvin is a senior editor at Fortune and uh, an, incre an incredibly captivating writer. He makes uh, much research on peak performance really come to life, especially the research of Anders Ericsson, whose book T Peak we, uh, I featured uh, last week, that you can also see if you like uh, this one. And uh, in Talent is Overrated, Jeff um, shares the thesis that innate talent or innate abilities is not as important as we might think when it comes to becoming a true world-class performer. And he uh, shares a lot of the misconceptions that we have about uh, talent, genes, and uh, abilities that are really holding us back from doing what it really takes to become world-class performers ourselves. And uh, in this video, I want to share the three key ideas, three of my favorite key ideas, which are first, what is required for becoming a world-class performer. Secondly, what are the characteristics of deliberate practice, which is the most effective practice method that's been researched? And thirdly, what, how do we spark and sustain our motivation to show up for practice? So first, what is required for becoming a world-class performer? Uh, I don't know how long you have been uh, watching these videos on uh, my YouTube channel, but uh, I've been uh, at least uh, been creating videos for two years right now. And I've been really passionate about sharing big ideas we can apply to our lives to realize our ultimate potential. But I haven't realized until recently that uh, sharing all of these great ideas about how, what we can do to become uh, better people uh, without really um, debunking or unrooting the misconceptions that prevents us from applying those ideas. It's much like uh, trying to lift a tent up, which uh, still has its plugs rooted into the ground. And it would be much easier if we just unplug the plugs before we try to lift the tent. So therefore, I want to first look at what isn't required to become a world-class performer. And the first thing is experience. The idea that uh, if we just do something for long enough and we uh, accumulate a lot of years of doing something, we will just eventually get better, like uh, driving a car or reading or uh, lifting weights. But as you might have realized in your own life, if you don't really make an intention to um, switch up your practice so you become better in those specific areas, then they're not going to pr improve much over the years. So experience is not required for world-class performer performance. What's also not required is an insane memory and intelligence, since those are very context-related. You can take uh, some IQ text tests about uh, abstraction or mathematical. Uh, you can uh, solve, try to solve mathematical problems, or you can try to memorize pieces where they are on a chessboard. But if you uh, try to take that memory ability and intelligence into another area, then uh, you may find yourself falling short of your expectations. Because you can take a chess player who's um, uh, kind of memorized all the different um, positions his pieces can have on the board. But if you place those pieces very randomly and not like he would do himself at all, then it's very hard for him to memorize where those pieces are on the board as opposed to when they are uh, placed in a logical way that he is used to. So memory and intelligence are context specific. And thirdly, you do not need genes or talent to become a world-class performer, like these uh, insanely great innate abilities that just make you shoot through the roof in something that you do. Because research has proven that these things might set you off from the crowd in uh, your early years, but uh, later, in your, uh, later in your life, what really matters is your resolute commitment to deliberate practice over years in the field that you want to master. So let's uh, look at what's not required for, for world-class performance and what is. 
What is required is deliberate practice. And that's what we'll look into in our second big idea right now. What are the characteristics of a deliberate practice, the most effective practice method? And uh, you might have been watching my uh, video on uh, Peak by Anders Ericsson, where I outlined some principles of deliberate practice, since he's kind of the guy who has um, uh, researched all these principles. And, um, but don't worry, uh, I'll uh, add a few more different ways of viewing these uh, principles right here. And uh, that's also always good to refine your perspective and see how you can use the um, principles for your own skill. And uh, the big problem with these principles is, of course, their deceptive simplicity. I got tricked uh, uh, by this simplicity for two years since I discovered these principles two years ago. And I knew some of the skills I wanted to improve, like teaching and uh, studying and such. But I uh, eventually uh, found out that uh, I haven't really applied them to my life until last week. I made a deliberate plan to apply the principles. So um, don't get fooled by the simplicity. Just start using them in each of your practice sessions. By, just by using one principle, you can start improving your practice. I've been uh, noticing results just these, uh, this last week by preparing and practicing PEAK and this video. So here are three characteristics of a deliberate practice. I'm not going to go into all of them, but here are some of the most important ones in my opinion. Firstly, the, your practice needs to be defined, uh, designed to improve a sp highly specific, well uh, detailed uh, or well defined aspect of your performance. You need to, a clear goal of what is it that I actually want to improve in this practice session right now which was for me in this um, video to make three clear points for each of the three key ideas. Firstly, tell a story with a point. Secondly, outline a problem that stops us from applying the idea. And thirdly, the solution or some suggestions for what you can do to apply these ideas yourself. So that's designed, your practice is designed to improve aspect of your performance. Second principle or characteristic of a deliberate practice is to have immediate feedback continuously available. Because if you don't have feedback on whether you are hitting the goals, the targets you have set for yourself in this session, then uh, you're much like a bowler who bowls uh, with a curtain down to his knees. You can't really see how you are doing, whether you are knocking the kegs down or not. And that becomes really hard to see your progress. It might be like an archer having blindfolded uh, archery practice. Or it might be like uh, the exam student who doesn't receive her answers on a test she did. Or she doesn't see them. So she doesn't correct the mistakes she made. So feedback is essential. And thirdly, the practice, deliberate practice, is not very fun. The idea is to get good as quickly and effectively as possible. And to do that, you need to deliberately seek out what you're not yet good at. And therefore you look for what's difficult and what's painful. You do those things, then look to see whether you made any mistakes and how you can correct them, what you need to do in your next practice session, which then becomes the goal that you set for that practice session. So these uh, principles are really going in a loop. But uh, essentials are goals, feedback, and difficulty. So those are some of the principles. Do you see how you can apply one or each of them to your own skill that you want to master or a field that you want to get really proficient at? One uh, suggestion for me is just to get clear on the goals that you have for this practice session. What do I want to improve? And then see whether you do improve that one and then repeat for next practice. That's a really simple way to do it like I do right now. So that's some of the characteristics of deliberate practice. Let's go to our third big idea. How do we spark and sustain our motivation to show up for our practice? Daily, weekly, or whatever. So, um, Darwin was uh, probably very good at this because uh, as you know, he uh, created, uh, wrote the book Origin of Species, where he formulated his theory of evolution. And it's uh, quite interesting how he did this. 
First, he was on a journey with the HMS Beagle, which was a great ship. I think the king or duke uh, sent them on a mission to do something. I don't know exactly what. But uh, eventually, Darwin came up onto a discovery, which uh, basically would prove, in his mind, the theory of evolution, which states that um, all the complex life forms today, like us, have uh, ascended from more and more simple life forms and uh, organisms over millions of uh, years with an uh, adaptation to the environment. And uh, when he um, discovered this, it became clear, really clear on what he really wanted, and that was to prove the theory of evolution. He uh, also probably believed that this would change the way science works with uh, animals and species and such, and the way humanity looks at our own origins, from uh, the view that uh, which was very common back then, that God created us uh, about 6,000 years ago, I think, to the view that we have uh, evolved through millennia and millions of years. So he became really clear on what he wanted and what he believed. And eventually he became, he was really obsessed about, oops, timer goes off. He uh, became really obsessed about uh, gathering a lot of different specimens of animals and insects he uh, dissected these really microscopic animals to get in more and more proof that the theory of evolution is real. And eventually he um, came out with a book. But uh, it must have, must have taken a really intense commitment to go through all of those hours and years of gathering those proofs, of dissecting those animals. And he probably also enjoyed it a lot. So, this leads us to one common problem uh, with... Uh, the skills we want to master, and it's that practice often gets really tedious and boring and really hard, which makes it uh, hard for us to find our motivation of why am I actually doing this, when I could be off do doing something much more simple, like going out uh, partying every weekend, or uh, watching movies all the time, or just relaxing on the bed doing nothing. And therefore, I wonder whether uh, these two answers can really help you to clarify your motivation, to spark and sustain motivation. So, ask yourself these two questions. What do I really want out of practicing this skill or becoming better at this field? And secondly, what do I believe? Where do I believe this will lead me to? Or how do I believe this will help me contribute to others? The answers to those questions would make it easier to you, for you to become motivated, to show up for your practice sessions. So that's three key ideas from Talent is Overrated. Let's uh, recap and conclude. In the first idea, we looked at what's required for world-class performance and what's not required. What's not required is experience, memory, intelligence, genes, and talent. What is required is deliberate practice, which was our second big idea, the characteristics of deliberate practice, which were we need a um, practice that is designed to improve some highly specific, well-defined aspect of our performance. In other words, we need a clear goal. We need continuous feedback available in a clear loops of whether we are hitting our goal. And we need uh, to know that uh, deliberate practice is not always fun. We are supposed to look out what's, look, seek out what's hard, what we can't yet do, because eventually we will be able to do them. Those are the three key ideas. And a quick look at Talent is Overrated by Jeff Colvin. I hope you enjoyed. Please uh, like this video and uh, share it with your friends. Leave a comment down below so I can follow up with you there. And uh, subscribe to my channel so you can stay up to date on key ideas for realizing your ultimate potential. Thank you very much for watching and I wish you an awesome day.